Uh, Gail is the co-founder of uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, which was launched in October 2018. And there are now 260 groups in more than 30 countries. She's from Yorkshire. She's the daughter of a coal miner and a train, uh, trained in molecular biophysics, and she gets the livestock issue. Hey. Gail, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> So, standing before you as a rebel, I don't run a protest or a campaign with others. Uh, we're in active rebellion against the British government. You have a right and a duty to rebel when you're not being kept safe. And that's across the political spectrum. If you listen to Hobbes or Locke, who are on the right of the political spectrum, they would say you have a right to rebel. So I just wondered who else considers themselves a rebel here? because I'm hoping, that's great, that's great. It's about a quarter of the audience. I'm hoping that's gone up by the end of it. That's my aim, is to have rebellious farmers. We are in the sixth mass extinction event. There have been five major extinction in the past in humanity. Um, this is the first one for humanity. The Permian-Triassic extinction was caused by runaway climate change. 97% of our life was wiped out, and we are emitting carbon and heating the planet at a greater rate than the Permian-Triassic extinction. The way we say it in Extinction Rebellion, and perhaps this is the working class last from Yorkshire, I, I live in Gloucestershire, is we're fucked. We really have to get... <laughs> <clears throat> it's, it's, it's fun to lighten it up, actually, because it's so serious. It's so serious. It's good to lighten it up. Um, and this system's finished. Whether you like it or not, it's on its way out. Economic growth falls by a, at least 1% uh, for every degree of warming, and we're aiming for around 4 degrees of warming in the current situation, uh, so, some of which is seen as uh, leading to human extinction by some, some quarters. A 1 degree of warming, crops yields decrease by 10%, and there are also drought effects. At two and a half degrees C, the world cannot produce the calories needed. We also know that nourishment in foods drops by a third. So the end of century projections are that the population will grow by 50% and food production will half. In the academic literature, it's known as multi-breadbasket failure when you get issues across different harvests. Latvia and Lithuania last year declared their harvest national disasters and emergency situations. We know that food shortages and food price spikes trigger social collapse, which is why credible commentators like Professor Shell Nuber, who is the head of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and an advisor to the German Chancellor to the European Union and the Pope, said that climate change is now reaching the end game the issue is the very survival of our civilization. He forwarded a paper, What Lies Beneath, which talked about the fact that the existential climate risk has been understated. The, when the IPCC says we've got 12 years to turn this around and talks about carbon, we don't have carbon budgets. There is no carbon left. There's 410 parts per million in the atmosphere. 270 was what was safe. You now have uh, Professor Sir David King starting a climate repair centre. That's the language we need to move into. We have to repair this situation. We don't have time left. Professor Jem Bendel's paper is the most uh, downloaded paper on deep adaptation, 450,000 downloads. He, his estimation is that social collapse is inevitable. It's coming soon. The immense catastrophe is very likely. We're talking about massive loss of human life and that human extinction is possible. So we're talking uh, in the language of biological annihilation. Species endangers one in four mammals, one in eight birds, a third of all amphibians, 70% of the world's plants. This is the heritage that we're leaving for our children. And this country is one of the most nature-depleted countries in the world. They talk about the insect apocalypse. A 2017 study showed a 75% decline in flying insects. A 2018 study that one in five British mammals 
could be extinct within a decade. We have to face the grief of these times in actual fact because it's super painful. And if you just keep it in your head and not in your heart, you don't find the love that is required to step forward with the courage that's necessary. The IPBES, which is the IPCC's equivalent on biodiversity, said a million species are at risk of extinction. Wildlife has been destroyed by <coughs> habitat destruction, overhunting, pollution, invasion by alien species, and also climate change. The ultimate cause is overpopulation and overconsumption by the rich. So something like 50% of all emissions is done by 10% of the population. So when, if you want to look at individual change that your children are begging for you to do when they're on the streets on school strikes, then the, 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 the flying and the consumption that people are doing needs to be tackled. If, if um, people would reduce their consumptions to that of the average European, this is figures from Professor Kevin Anderson, then carbon emissions would go down by a third. So there is an issue here of individuals as well as policy changes. It used to be the case that uh, I think the vast majority of animals in the world were wild animals, just a few percent of humans. Now 60% are livestock for food, 36% are humans and only 4% are wild animals. And we know that we have an issue of soil erosion in the UK. We are 30 to 40 years away from a fundamental loss of fertility. In the, in the face of that, what do we do? Well, first of all, we, so we launched Extinction Rebellion on October the 31st last year on Sawain. And our, we have three demands. Firstly, that we have to tell the truth. The government has to tell the truth and the media has to tell the truth. And this is an existential crisis. This is not yet another policy issue. We demand uh, net zero actually by 2025 because this is a, needs a wartime economy and we want to see a tackling of biodiversity loss. If you have longer term targets, we know that business as usual means we'll just kick the ball into the long grass and we will let those targets be lost and, and we will be fucked if that's what happens. Uh, we don't take positions on specific bits of policy in Extinction Rebellion. There are debates out there. There is an animal rights lobby that, in my opinion, mixes up the issues around what they will talk about speciesism and how they feel about uh, uh, animal rights with an environmental argument. And there is also an argument, I think a very strong one personally, for regenerative agriculture, for pasture-fed livestock and so on. And the farming lobby needs to be with us on the streets making that case. In any case, how will we come up with policies? A citizens' assembly uh, will be called, which will not be the one that's uh, been announced recently because it will be legally binding. A citizens' assembly is chosen by sortition. It's random, like you would have a jury service. It's like Greek democracy was originally. And the ra random selection of people will make the policy decisions. They will be taught critical thinking skills and experts will be there. They won't be subject to poly uh, uh, lobbying and to the kind of uh, capture by vested interests that politics today is. And we want to see a just transition with that for both people in this country and for people uh, overseas. The solutions are many and I think it's so much about the land. This is an issue of ecology more than physics and it always worries me when we talk about carbon and carbon atoms as if it's a physics issue. It's about water, it's about nitrogen. So um, the land and the relationship with the land is super important. And whilst uh, as a scientist myself, I'm all into innovation and data and experiments, I think fundamentally the relationship that a farmer has with their land through deep connection to that land is, is the data that you actually need because all land is different and when you make it all about data and, and, and so on it can, it can take away from that lived experience of what you know about your own, your own land. 
Well, you know, when we launched on October 31st, what I thought was so utterly auspicious was that there was another group in Parliament Square with us. It was the Nature Friendly Farmers. Are any of them here today? Uh, you were out there with your wellies and your suits on, and I went over and I said, we need you. We are aligned. We might look like a bunch of crusty hippies, although we do try and look differently with our suits on and so on. Um, as I remember, you guys had paid £1,000 for public liability insurance, which I think is an absolute flipping travesty that people pay to be in Parliament Square. We were there breaking all the rules with our amplification systems, with our banners, saying this is our democracy, this is how we do democracy, and we took over the streets and blocked the road outside of Parliament. Um, and that's what I'm really calling for you farmers to join us in. Uh, here's an experiment uh, about water retention. So on the, on the left-hand side, you can see that when you have a healthy pasture, uh, water is retained. I think the farming lobby needs to not just talk about carbon capture, but talk about Jem Bendel's agenda of adaptation. How are we going to survive these times when you're going to have incredible fluctuations in the weather? We know that the world's farms have lost 50 to 70 percent of their carbon. Um, there are um, carbon cutting toolkits online and soil health apps you can use to, to move in the right direction that hedgerows could increase their carbon capture by 50%. And here's a beautiful slide that was shared with me uh, by uh, Dr. John Meadsley from the Pasture Fed Livestock Association. You can see in the background what it looks like when you have an unhealthy relationship with the land, uh, when, it's, when there's a drought and the, and the land is suffering, and this beautiful, healthy pasture. And my understanding is that cattle can self medicate uh, with that kind of pasture. So we need to call in the old ways in a new way. So we took to the streets in April in an active rebellion against the government, against the British government, and it was an international rebellion. We, uh, we smashed uh, a window of the Shell building, and that was in honour of Polly Higgins, a beautiful uh, lawyer who is calling for the law of ecocide and unfortunately died in April, but her work uh, based in Stroud continues. Um, and that smashing of the windows is so that we can go have a jury trial to say that Shell knew what was happening uh, for many years around the climate emergency. We occupied London over five locations over 11 days. There were over 1,000 arrests. Uh, the figures have actually changed. Uh, we're now over 130 groups across the UK. We're in 58 different countries. And what we're doing is based in science, actually. It's in social science, how things change. Lobbying your MP, signing petitions, going on marches, it doesn't work. It helps raise the issue, but you need an active confrontation when you want to see change. It can be beautiful, it can be peaceful, it can be respectful, but that's what's necessary and that's what takes uh, change to happen. And people celebrate rebellions and civil disobedience from the past. And they say, wasn't it wonderful, Martin Luther King and the suffragettes? But when it's today, they go, oh, my goodness, you know, you're inconvenienced in Londoners. And I do apologise. It's not cool to do that to people. But it's clear that when you look at this graph, which is the concern about the environment, which sp spiked in 2014 with a flooding and grew in the autumn with the school strikes, with the IPCC, David Attenborough's uh, productions and so on. And you can see there the spike when Extinction Rebellion protests work. This form of change is necessary and works, and you must be part of it. <coughs> you don't actually need uh, everybody to get involved in an active rebellion. You need up to 3.4% of the population. And you don't need people to like you, but you need them to be having the conversation. And that's what happens when you create disruption. So here's Greta Thunberg saying, you only talk about moving forwards with the same bad ideas that got us into this mess. The government's announced net zero by 2050, way too long in the future, and a very unjust thing to do to other countries. And they're are going to be having a citizens' assembly, but again, it's not legally binding. Where's DEFRA in that citizens' assembly? Why is the farming community not being included? Are you not a business? Uh, I think that you guys need to be absolutely at the heart of that and not seen as a, a poor relation. 
and that the issues of rural poverty and land justice need to be raised at the same time. So we are calling on a rebellion for the autumn and we're really asking you to join us and stop being so fucking British. Can we not get like the French? And uh, seriously, bring some tractors into the centre of London to the rebellion, you know? This is not going to happen by nice, polite lobbying where you pay £1,000 for a picture, folks. This is what it's going to take. Um, the innovations there, the solar tractors I've seen, it's, it's, it's brilliant, but it won't come through on the, on the volume that's needed without getting on the streets. So join us and bring your tractors. And let's have that healthy debate. Cows. I, the animal rights folks might have a word. Would they be safe? Would they be happy? I don't know. But um, let's have those debates, you know, with, 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 with vegans coming from an animal rights perspective. Make your case. Let's get on the streets together. It needs all of us, folks. Join us, bring your tractors. Thank you. Our third speaker is a man who has a climate change perspective and a legal perspective. He is Martin Wilder. Uh, he's head of global environmental markets at Baker McKenzie. He specializes in climate change, international carbon, and broader environmental markets, climate and conservation finance, and conservation projects. Martin, welcome. Okay, thank you very much, and it's a, it's a pretty hard act to follow after, um, after Minette and Gail, so I'm going to try to do my best. <laughs> um, but I think, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, many of you heard Ch Charlie last night. I also come from Australia, which is a country that's very different to the UK. Um, we have beautiful green areas, but we also have a land of deserts and, and floods and droughts. And, and we also have a very interesting and difficult challenge going on at the moment between the agricultural sector and the mining sector. And at the heart of that challenge is, is a, as Charlie said last night, the desire to build a massive coal, coal, um, a, a massive, um, coal mine in an area that has some of the richest farming and the, and the most important water resources in the country. Yet at the same time, and so what we've seen in Australia, and I think you're sort of witnessing it here as well, I think in the last year the farming community has really uh, recognised the importance of climate change and also the, sig the significant need to address that. And I don't, I don't think anywhere really in the world anymore, as, um, as Gail said, is there any denial of the importance of the need to deal with climate change. And I think what we are seeing in multiple countries around the world is legislation coming in that requires countries to move their economies to net zero emissions by 2050 or 2040 or 2030. The challenge is, I think, as Gail said, 2050 is too late and we need to accelerate that change. But I think it's, that's a very important point because we are on this global path where many countries are aligning in a very similar way, which is an important point I'll come back to when we talk about uh, the idea of, of protecting your measures in terms of standards. Um, the second thing that's very important in a lot of these countries is what role does agriculture play? And I think Patrick asked at the beginning, part of the reason that we're here today is to ask what is the role of agriculture towards climate change and in, in, and in terms of dealing with climate change and moving to net zero emissions. And in, and in countries like Australia and New Zealand, that has been a very difficult debate. The debate has been that uh, agriculture is a key part of the economy. Um, agriculture contributes a lot of the emissions to the economy. Yet the debate from the agricultural sector has largely been but we should not in any way be regulated or under an obligation to reduce emissions. Um, and when you look at how it played out in New Zealand, some of you may know that many years ago they tried to introduce a, car a carbon tax in New Zealand on, on, on methane from animals. That, was, that launched a campaign called the fart tax. Overnight it died very quickly and politically it was very toxic. But New Zealand have just introduced a net zero emissions bill. Um, and they've also introduced an obligation on, on the farming sector to reduce methane by 10%. Um, in the Australian context, historically, there's also been a, a pretty tough debate there about the role of agriculture in working towards re re reducing emissions. And I think the, the difference in, in the Australian context is that rather than, than sort of instructing farmers to do things to reduce emissions, it has been very much an incentive-based approach. And so many of the measures that, that, that I want to just talk to you slightly about today, sorry, shortly about today in Australia, are things that we touched on very much last night and things that we've sort of talked about a little bit today. So in the Australian context, the, the, the notion of having to deal with climate change 
uh, there are two ways that globally that's been done. It's either been done by putting a tax or an impost or, a, or some sort of trading scheme as you've seen in Europe with the European ETS, or alternatively it's been, it's been implementing some sort of program that encourages people to take action that can improve the environment. And in the Australian context, we have a very significant scheme called the Emission Reduction Fund, which is a federal government fund of a couple of billion dollars, and, it, and it's focused on the land sector. And what it does is it pays people to take actions that generate carbon reductions, um, either through planting trees, avoiding trees being chopped down, through soil carbon, um, and through, a range, through methane capture on farms and through a range of other measures. And, and, and the scheme's a very well-developed scheme. You get scientific-based approaches which you follow to reduce emissions and for every tonne of, of abatement that you do, the government will pay you the current market prices around $15 to $20 a tonne uh, for that carbon. So it's very much, um, a, a, I guess, an incentive approach to do that. And one area where, as Charlie said last night, which is the first time it's been done, is in the soil carbon space. So the first soil carbon credits were issued a few weeks ago and the government has paid for those. In addition to that, we also have been experimenting in Queensland, which is one of the, the largest Australian states, on a new fund called the Land Restoration Fund. So while at one level the government is paying people to keep trees in the ground, at another level, at a state level, the governments have been allowing, allowing landholders to clear landscapes. And many of you may not know this, but Australia has probably the second highest deforestation rate in the world, which is an incredible, um, incredible sort of claim considering when you think of deforestation, you think of the Amazon and other areas. Um, and so the Land Restoration Fund in Queensland is designed to pay farmers additional funds not to clear land or to do things on their land that restore habitats. One of the biggest problems we have in Australia at the moment is koalas are almost extinct. They're coming very close to that. It's a real problem. And so part of this fund is to restore koala habitat. So if you can do a project that basically improves the landscape, it, it, it improves soil carbon and does a few other things, then what will happen is you'll be able to apply to the fund to get funding to do that. Um, in addition to that, there's also a recognition that many of the activities on the land affect the reef, the Great Barrier Reef, and so another system that they're also developing is what's called reef credits. So if as stewards, if as stewards of your land you can do things to avoid runoff into the reef, then there's another system to get credits as well for that. So the whole system is designed to push and drive and incentivise the, the custodians of the landscape to really do, do, do things that will improve in that. Um, another thing that we've also been doing in the Australian context is we have two very large institutions, similar to your Green Investment Bank. One is called the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and one is, is another which I chair, which is called the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. And we give out loans or funds or grants for activities that, that go towards um, renewable energy. Now, in, interestingly, one of the big projects that we've done Recently, as we've funded a very large agricultural fund that, that, that funds a lot of businesses, and we've said, you've traditionally been paying at around um, a, 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 an interest rate of around 6%. We'll repackage that interest rate and we'll make it 4%. And if you can, in your farming activities, hit certain sustainability hurdles, we'll drop the interest rate to 3 So there's a real, there's a real sort of... And many of the traditional banking um, sector, many of the banks are actually now offering these packages where they encourage people... Um, you'll get your normal loan, but if you meet some sustainability criteria, which are not too difficult, then they'll drop the loan at um, uh, um, 1%, for example. So these innovative mechanisms are really important because while at the outset people don't think they do much, very quickly they drive significant change. And the other area where we're also seeing a, a lot of changes in the energy sector. So Australia has, is, gone through, is going through a revolution. We have some of the highest energy prices in the world. Some of our states are going 100% renewable energy, and it's a really dy dynamic time. But because the costs are so high, many farmers who have very high energy costs pump a lot of water, have actually invested heavily in renewable energy. And so we've seen sort of um, that happen as well. So we're in this sort of transition phase around energy, as, uh, energy in addition to that. And then finally, the other area which I often don't think about is exporting the skill sets. So many farmers, and I mean, Charlie really was up here last night talking about the great things that, are, that he's doing and, and how that can be done elsewhere. The Australian government's played a real role in exporting what is traditional fire management. So in Australia, indigenous communities manage the landscape through, through fire management, and the government's taking that to parts of Africa and elsewhere at the moment in order to improve land management in a way that has been done, um, I guess, through traditional communities. Um, so where does this leave us? I think. Often, and it was interesting for me to hear the debate last night coming from an Australian context about, about some of the challenges that exist. I just want to quickly touch on those. So firstly is, is the, the, the question that if we do this, 
and, and, and we have really good standards and really good approaches, other people will just come and flood our market with, in effect, products that don't meet those standards. One of the interesting things is that many countries around the world who are developing climate change legislation, that legislation puts an impost on anybody in the jurisdiction to do certain things that contribute to climate change. In the Victorian legislation in Australia, the gov every decision that government makes of any nat nature that is of any significance, climate change has to be taken into account. Those sorts of measures actually are very useful tools to, to enable you to put standards in place that put an obligation on everybody to move in a certain direction. And interestingly, that Victorian legislation requires the government itself and its ag sector to hit net zero emissions by a particular date. So there is an ability to do that increasingly. And I think the other thing that we're seeing, uh, which is really important, and I think this will rapidly change the landscape, is around the world there's a significant amount of litigation against very large companies who don't take good action on climate. Um, and that is it, that will end up like the tobacco litigation, and we're going to see that play out in, in the next couple of years. Another issue is measurement. We often get told, well, it's very hard to measure biodiversity, it's very hard to measure these things. In the Queensland front at the moment, we had a big debate a couple of weeks ago, how do you actually measure that you're improving koala habitat? How do you actually work out that you're doing better biodiversity? These are things that, are, that, that have been done around the world for some time, but they're still difficult. But the fact that you can't measure it now doesn't mean you can't do it. So there are ways to sort of start things. And in the, the soil carbon me methodology in Australia, the government took the view that it was better to get a, a methodology out, even if the measurement of carbon was small. But over time, as you improve the methodology, the science gets improved and then you can do a lot more. So we have to start and start fast and we'll, we'll get better as we go. And then finally, the final challenge, I think, is this issue of closed minds. When I was running a, a um, chairing an organisation in Australia called Low Carbon Australia, we were set up specifically to give um, loans to farmers to do energy efficiency in the farming sector. And in the, we, were, we were set up for three years, and in the first year, no farmer was interested in talking to us. They just, you know, didn't, thought it was all too hard. Then one of the major um, uh, pork producers in the country took, out a, took a loan out from us to basically capture methane on their plant and generate electricity. Um, they reduced their energy bill in the first year by 70%. And what was interesting about that was that it, the, the individual company who did it was so famous that w within three weeks we had every single producer in the country at the door of the organisation wanting to do this. So I think having an open mind and being prepared to test things is really important. And so I think when, when you, if you can get over those challenges, I think there are a lot of things that can be done in the ag sector. And also you'll, it'll improve productivity and it'll make you leaders in the field and we'll start to really get towards that net zero emissions target. Thanks.